officers here in town, uh, Brad Peltier. I don't know if you know him. He was over in Iraq at the same time that I was, but I never knew that he was over. I didn't know him at the time, and we were in two different locations, so his experiences are a lot different than mine. So I'll be able to talk to you about what my experiences were, and I was over there for a year, so we have a lot of stuff that we did, and uh, also I understand that you guys were learning about the uh, Gulf War, the uh, uh, Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Well, I was in the Army at that time, too. I was with the uh, 1st Infantry Division. I didn't go over with them. I stayed back at Fort Riley, but the 1st Infantry Division went over, and they went across the berms and on into Iraq uh, in 1990, so back a ways. Uh, I was there in 2003, through, uh, I went into Iraq on Easter Sunday of uh, 2003 and came home at the end of March in 2004. Um, you guys know where uh, Iraq is? Yes. Here's where we are over here in the United States, right in the middle of the United States. This line right here comes across through the middle of Texas. I was at Fort Hood, Texas when we deployed, and so we took our stuff down to the ports in uh, Texas and shipped it on ships uh, over to, and we actually were going to come in through Turkey. Our stuff was supposed to be <coughs> offloaded in Turkey, and then we were going to come in around and through the north part of Baghdad, or through the north part of Iraq, down into our area of operations where we were supposed to operate. We couldn't get an agreement with the Turkish government, so our stuff sat there and floated around in the Mediterranean Sea for a long time, waiting to get permission to go into Turkey, and they never gave us permission. So then our stuff had to come through the Suez Canal down here by uh, Egypt and come down through the Red Sea all the way across and back into the Persian Gulf to Kuwait, and it got offloaded in Kuwait. So when we deployed, we flew from Texas to Kuwait City and got out of the planes in Kuwait City. And let's see here. Can I step up here? Okay, so this is our act. We came into Kuwait City down here, and then, like I said, we um, were sitting in our our tents out in the middle of the desert in Kuwait because we didn't stay in Kuwait City. Since we hit the ground at the airport, we got into uh, got transported <coughs> out into the desert in Kuwait, and we sat there in tents waiting until we had all of our equipment in and then deployed up into Iraq. And like I said, I went in on Easter Sunday. We came up, and we came on this road right here, all the way up. We convoyed uh, for two days straight, and then stopped until we got half uh, to the night of the second day. So we drove for 36 hours uh, straight. Uh, because of that, the Humvee that was in front of me, which was one of my Humvees, ran into the truck that was in front of it, completely destroyed the front end of it. Uh, all of the radiator fluid in it were gone. We had no way to fix it and no way to tow it. We stripped everything out of it, pushed it to the side of the road, and kept going. I never saw that Humvee again. And nobody else did either. We, uh, we lost the Humvee the first day in second day we stopped just north of Baghdad, here's Baghdad, and stopped in a, uh, uh, an airfield that was an Iraqi airfield. Next morning after uh, being there overnight, I got up and I was sleep sleeping right next to a big crater where our airplanes during the initial part of it had bombed and blew up the, uh, the airplanes and stuff that were in that hangar. So I was sleeping right next to a crater and I didn't even know it. 
Next day then we came up and we were up in this area right here. All up in this area. If you see, this kind of gets a little bit uh, mountainous and hilly over here. This is Iran right here. We had a pretty good, uh, pretty good uh, mountains up, uh, right along the edge of uh, Iran's border with uh, Iraq. But we were in three different provinces of Iraq in this part. We went all the way to the Iran border, and we were just south of Mosul, which is there. Okay. This I'll take and hand this around. When we first got to um, Kuwait, I hand this around. This is a little script map that shows us where we were going to go, and they call them cabals. Uh, that was just a big open spot in the desert that we stayed in that all of our tents were in. And so we went to uh, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. That was the name of the cabals that we were on. And that's just a strip map so that we knew how to get from uh, Kuwait City up to where we were going in the desert. Once we did get out in the desert, and we went out one time to uh, fire, you look all around and there's just no landmarks out there whatsoever. So uh, it was a really good thing that we had GPS for one thing, but I also took a compass with me too because you just couldn't tell what direction was what because there was nothing out there to go off of. They also uh, taught us a little bit about uh, customs and um, just how to treat people over there so that we didn't offend somebody just because we didn't know that we were doing something that was offensive to them. For instance, you don't shake hands with your left hand. It's considered a uh, an unclean hand. So you always offer your right hand and shake hands with your right hand. You also, they they do a uh, thing where they go to the chest and, and and you say salam alaikum and that means peace be with you. So we learned how to do that and that would kind of break the ice and ease any tension that there might be. And you also never showed anybody the sole of your foot because again, the sole of your foot is what touches the ground and they consider that dirty. They, they, so if I were sitting at a chair and had my feet up like this to you guys, that would be an insult to them. So those are the kind of things that we taught us on that, and that around, take a look at that. I was the uh, commander of a finance battalion, and so our responsibility was to handle any kind of money or anything of value that uh, that came within our area. In our area, I, I told you we were in three different provinces. Well, the size of those provinces together were roughly the same size as the state of West Virginia. So a pretty good size uh, <coughs> territory. And there were three different provinces which would kind of equate to our counties here three different provinces that we were responsible for working with the governments and for me working with all of the banks within those different provinces. But I also made the mistake of telling uh, my boss, General Odierno, one time, we got there, like I said, right in April. Well, uh, just a couple, three weeks later, the latter part of May, well, it starts getting really warm over there pretty quickly. They grow wheat over there. And I noticed nobody was harvesting the wheat, so I was in a meeting one time and I told General, General Odierno that somebody needed to make sure that the word got out to the farmers that we weren't going to interfere with them, that they could go ahead and start uh, getting their wheat harvested, or else it would start all just bending over and breaking to the ground, and they wouldn't be able to get it. So after that meeting, or actually right as soon as I got done telling him that, he said, good, you're the uh, Minister of Agriculture. <laughs> so I got to go out and tell everybody that it was okay for them to uh, start uh, harvesting. I also was the Minister of Irrigation, uh, Minister of Commerce, and, uh, oh gosh, it seems like there was another one. 
Anyway, I got stuck with a lot of different tasks that really didn't fall under finance battalion, which made the entire time pretty interesting. So I got to go out and I got to go see all kinds of things. We went to all the uh, brain elevators within that entire area, and like I said, our area was the size of uh, West Virginia. We went out to all those, checked to make sure that they were operating. If they weren't, help them get the stuff to be able to get them back into operation. And then we also went to the banks and inspected the banks. Okay, can you go next slide? This is uh, another shot of Iraq. We were in the Sladin province, the Tamin province. Atamin is how it actually um, the Yala province. We were responsible for the uh, Salomea province, but we didn't have to do much up there. These people were very pro-Western, very pro-American. Matter of fact, went to a place that was a knockoff of McDonald's up there. It was called McDowell's. And had a hamburger. That was the only place in Iraq that I actually took off my helmet and my uh, body armor and walked around in town with just a soft cap on and my regular uniform. Every place else that we went, we always had, of course I always had my weapon, but we always had our body armor on and we always wore our helmet. All, anytime we went anywhere in Iraq, you had to because uh, they were, there was always the threat that they would do something and they did do a lot of stuff. Uh, there was uh, four times that they lobbed in either an RPG at us or uh, shot mortars at us. And then there were other times uh, in convoys where they blew up uh, uh, an IED, I don't know if you learned about that, improvised explosive device that they just make it out of something, usually artillery shells, place it along the highway and, and then wait until you come by and, and then set it off and blow it up. Had one happen right to a vehicle right in front of us. Uh, luckily, they it blew up, and it blew literally up, and so it blew out their windshield. And so I went up there and we we kicked out the windshield, made sure they were all okay. They had a little bit of cuts and stuff, but um, and then we got back on the road. So we were we were really lucky. Never got hit. Did have one of my. Um, Two of my soldiers were riding in a Humvee, and they drove over one, and it blew up. I uh, really hurt the two other guys who were in the vehicle with them, but um, both of my guys came out of it, and the only thing they had were uh, ringing in their ears, so they lucked out pretty well, too. But, um, they were the Iraqis who didn't want us there, which was not everybody. A lot of them did want us there, but the Iraqis who were... Um, didn't want us there. You always had to be careful that they were uh, might try to kill you, and you just had to keep your guard up. Anyway, we were in these three provinces, and so like I said, uh, those all of the irrigation systems, which um, I don't know if um, you got taught, the Tigris and the Euphrates. This is the Euphrates River here, and this is the Tigris River here. We were right along the Tigris River. Um, big history. This, basically, the Tigris and Euphrates River valleys, those are like the cradle of civilization. So not from my history, but I'm talking back thousands of years. So this, this area has a lot, a lot of history. Anyway, they run all of the irrigation out of these two rivers. So any of the, up here at the Tigris, any of the irrigation that they ran off to, to uh, water their wheat fields, that came out of here. And they also used that for their drinking water and just water for uh, being taking baths, that kind of stuff. Okay, next slide. This is where, sorry if you can't see that very well. That was my home for the first two and a half months or so was this tent right here. We set up 
and the more it got into the summer and the more that we drove over it or walked on it, the more the dust became just like talcum powder. And so if you've ever uh, had talcum powder, if you've taken step in that, when it's this deep, it just poofs up around your foot and up into the air. And that's what we were dealing with. You can see it blowing here a little bit. Well, that wasn't even a real bad storm. That was a barely any wind at all. We dealt with that all the time. The computers that we had and most of the military now runs on some kind of computers that fine dust gets into your computer and ruins it. So it wasn't very long. You turn the lights back on. Uh, it wasn't very long that we had to start buying computer equipment. And I brought this with me because if you look at the keyboard, and I'll have this around, look at the keyboard, the red stuff, that's Arabic numbering and Arabic letters. So the other stuff is what we use as our letters and numbers. But on this keyboard that I bought while we were over there because our equipment got ruined, it's got the Arabic numbering system on there. Okay, next slide, please. This is uh, my sergeant major and myself. We unfurled our battalion colors. That's my, uh, the battalion's colors there, or our flag. And this was my driver. Uh, we officially unfurled them there. What this was is the front gate that we're standing on the inside of the gate. The outside is where the rest of the Iraqis live. Um, this was on the palace grounds that after that three months after we moved out of the tents that I showed you there on the, uh, that in the slide before here, we moved into the palace ground. Palace grounds was probably about the size of the city of Kozad, maybe even bigger. He had, uh, I believe, about 40 or 50 different palace buildings there. And I lived in one of those palaces for the remainder of the year that I was there. This, like I said, is the front gate. See these two statues right there? That's Saddam leading his soldiers into uh, battle and victorious and all this kind of stuff. One thing was, uh, I think he was already hiding in his hole by the time <laughs> we, were, uh, we even started this whole thing. He wasn't very victorious. He didn't lead him into battle. We took him. While I was there, we blew both those statues off, and we made a monument, which I'll show you at the end of it, that is to our dead soldiers out of the brat or bronze that those uh, statues are made out of. Actually, the same guy who made those two statues is the one that made the sta our wow. statue for us. Hmm. Okay, next slide. This is an aerial view. One time I was riding in a helicopter on one of the missions that I went on, and so I took this picture from the helicopter looking down on the palace grounds. Um, the gate that I was just showing you, it's actually over here off of the picture, about right in here. What you notice here is this this is where Saddam lived when he lived in Tikrit, because this is all this is Tikrit, which was his hometown. He was from um, basically that immediate area right there. So he built all these palaces. This back here on the very back, that is the Tigris River running right along there and on out of the picture, so all this water comes in off of the Tigris River to fill these different lakes that are, were here. These, this was the main palace where Saddam would stay when he was there. That was uh, hit so, with so many different bombs that we never went in it. With the, it was condemned, and so we didn't go in it. We didn't use it or anything. The rest of these we used to house our soldiers. So we had soldiers housed in um, all these, this one became our uh, recreation palace, had ping pong tables, there's a swimming pool inside of that. Um, just all kinds of stuff in there for us to uh, pool, go and play there. Um, this one we called the water palace because it actually straddled. Uh, the lake is on both sides of it and it is in the lake. You walk through it and you're walking over the top of the lake. 
And then the one I stayed in was actually right over here. I worked right up, you can't really see it, but my tent where we were working, and then later, about halfway through the year, they brought in a modular kind of like what you guys have out here at the end of the building that became my office. And so then we worked out of that office and it was right in, right in here. And all the helicopters landed right here too, uh, going in and out. Okay, next slide. This is the ice palace. That's the one that I lived in. On both ends were uh, rooms that was uh, uh, two stories with really tall ceilings on both floors. Um, and then in the center, there where that dome is, there was a swimming pool that the water would come through and spill out into here and then out into the lake. We never did fill the swimming pool because we had soldiers sleeping in there. And, and I got to live inside of one of the, like a little cubby hole back in behind the swimming pool. I got my own, I called it my hooch. Okay, next slide. That one is a picture of what was our R&R &R palace. But um, I'd go running in the mornings, and this was one morning that the mist was coming up off of the thing, and I thought that was a pretty cool picture, so I went running back and got the camera. But um, I mean, really pretty, pretty country. I just don't recommend visiting there. <laughs> really pretty right next to the river, otherwise it was pretty crappy. Okay, next slide, please. This one is uh, the, the water palace that I was talking about that straddles the lake itself. When Dan Rather, uh, he's a news anchor, came over, he stayed there. Um, also, Ollie North, Oliver North, came in and stayed with us and did some interviews. And, uh, he stayed there too. Uh, a pretty nice palace, and I've got another picture later that uh, shows you the <coughs> stairwell inside of there. They they talked about. Uh, I'll take questions later. Okay. Um, they talked about having. Gold thrones, the gold, <laughs> yeah, thrones, like in a bathroom, the toilet. Um, and they actually did have that there was a gold lining on them, or gold, uh, just a thin thing that ran on them. But they also had gold all the way throughout and gold on the, the stairwell, which I'll show you later. So, next slide. This is uh, while we were over there. Um, as the summer comes up, some people would rotate out of command, and that's what this was. It's not a real good picture, but this is one of the changes of command that we had a commander pass the command to another commander. So we, we continued on with the ceremonies and the, the change of command while we were over there. Okay, next. This is another picture. These were some really neat palaces. I would have loved to have lived in one of these. They're right next to the water, um, just in little places, but tucked back in behind the hill. Just, just some really neat places back in there. Okay, this is where I'm talking about the, you see how that gold? That's what that is. That's gold. The staircase, and that was inside the water palace. The water's out back in behind here. You can't see because this one's closed, but back in behind there. So the stairs went up and up to the next level and then up to the next level above that. Pretty, really ornate. Of course, this was our uh, division patch. So that's what I wore uh, actually on my right shoulder. Um, and that, there's ours also. So we put that and that up. Those weren't there. Okay, next. This, by the way, that was our sergeant major from our finance, the command above me. And so that's who that is. She was our sergeant, uh, command sergeant major from the next level up. That's another picture of the stairs. You see how they're marble stairs and just really ornate, uh, really nice. And what's so bad about that is Saddam lived as a very, very rich man. And the people who he had um, as his closest uh, friends and family, they lived as very rich and very uh, privileged people. 
but the people who were outside that gate, matter of fact, could you go back up uh, several slides? All the way back up to the one right here. Back down one. Okay. Talking about that Saddam had his privileged people. Those were the only people who ever saw the inside of this. Everybody else, the common Iraqi, if they got in there, it was probably because they weren't going to be living very long. Because they were that ruthless. They uh, really, there was no rule of law. It was whatever Saddam wanted or his sons wanted. Well, they could just take somebody and take them in and torture them and kill them. For no reason at all. So we would take the people who were working with us as interpreters or the people who I worked with as bankers and as the dairy, which I'll show you a picture of that later, um, or the grain elevators. We'd take them in here and, and be meeting with them and talking about what we're trying to do and what and helping them do stuff. And they they tell us we would have never seen this when Saddam was in power. Never. And if they did, then they would probably be taken in there because they were going to get uh, into really big trouble. Well, the reason I brought you back to this slide is because you see how there are two walls here. Those are concrete walls and they were about 12 to 15 feet tall. So really tall. There were two of them. So you had the inner one that if you got inside the outer one, you still had to get through the inner one. And you see how they're not perfectly parallel or right up next to each other all the way around. They were more like, they were a maze. So even if you got over the first wall, then you were inside of the maze. And they had guard towers all throughout, and there's only one there, but there's, there's guard towers all the way around that thing that had clear fields of view view all the way around and down outside and in that center thing. So if somebody were trying to get into, get to, uh, do any kind of harm to uh, Saddam or any of his people, well, you had to get through these and it was very easy for them to shoot you while you were trying to get through this. Because like I said, it was, it was a maze and these things wound around and you had to know how to get through them to get to where the openings are to actually get in. So very well protected here because his people would kill him if they had a chance because either you were in with his close friends and relatives or you were in danger of your life. Okay, now you can go all the way down. Remember, we talked about dictators, how dictators usually rule with an iron fist, and so we kind of talked about how if you were outside of that, that you um, were probably mistreated as a citizen of that nation if there was a dictator. And that's one of the things that in our Pledge of Allegiance, we say with liberty and justice for all. Well, those aren't just words. They actually mean something. Justice for all. That means we live by a rule of law. And that law is supposed to apply to everybody the same. And all those laws are supposed to apply to everybody the same. And that's not how they were there. They didn't have laws, they just, if he felt like doing something, he did it. And if it meant that he was gonna kill 10 people because he wanted to, well, that's what happened. Okay, now you can go next. This is a picture of downtown Tikrit. See all their, this is another problem with, uh, socialism in this case is see all those cars there's not much difference there you go out out here in Kozat there's cars all different kinds of cars these are all the same because that's all the government would provide so if you had a car okay well it's just like your neighbor's car hope you like white <laughs> you also see the amount of trash that's on the ground and just it's a, it's a very basic uh, subsistence, very basic living. They, they didn't produce much as far as uh, goods and uh, products. If they bought anything, it came out from outside of the country. And this is just a little market here where 
guys set up stuff to sell and that's what they're doing there is buying, uh, bartering. Okay, next slide. This one here, you said all of them are white. Well, except for the ones that were orange and white. Those are the taxis. So you see them going buzzing down the street all the time. They were they were taxis. A little bit blurry, but that's that's another picture of uh, of Tecree. Okay, next slide. This is uh, what my operations officer, Lieutenant Vince Garcia. Like I said, we are res we were responsible for anything of any value. Well, five different times they captured gold bars. Uh, within our area of operations. And so those all got turned into my unit. And so uh, Vince and I went out there and had other of uh, my guys out there. Uh, and we took possession of those and took them back to Kuwait to get them valued and stuff so that then that money from that could come back into country. And that's what we did with all the money that we captured was bring that back into uh, Iraq and use it to rebuild their schools, their hospitals, um, their grain bins, just all that stuff. Okay, next slide. That's where we're offloading those things. More my guys there. Okay. We're putting those onto a plane, we're putting them into a um, a tub that then that's a pallet down underneath there. You can get a uh, forklift underneath it and load it onto the plane. Okay, next. Okay, like I said, I was a uh, minister of uh, banking also. So this here, what that is, is uh, my battalion's crest. That was our model, We're always there and ready. And then that was uh, Fourth Infantry Division. And then they, uh, four, uh, so the Fourth Infantry Division, uh, that was the unit that we were there in support of. Okay, next one. These are uh, some of the bankers that I met with. That's me there uh, with my helmet on when we were outside. And then we got down to the palace. This was uh, one of Saddam's palaces down in uh, Baghdad, his, his main palace down in Baghdad, which where uh, even now our embassy is. And, and if you ever heard of the Green Zone, well, that was Saddam's palace grounds in Baghdad. It was within that green zone. So these are all the different bankers that I went down there to meet with and try to get their banks reopened and get the currency going because like I said they were a socialist country so all of their payroll came in from the, the federal government and was paid out to the people. So these guys' job was to get that money and get it distributed out to people for whatever payroll that they were getting soldiers, all everything. Okay, next. We also, because we went in during the initial conflict, uh, they had Saddam's picture on all the money. And because Saddam had been deposed and putting in new leadership, we didn't want Saddam's picture on the money anymore. So, one of the missions, the main missions that we did while I was there is within three months, we took every bit of currency that was in the country, took it out, and put new currency in. And if you can imagine that, in the United States trying to do that, and trying to do that in three months, it was a pretty big deal. We were hauling money by the truckloads, literally. I, you know, I, I saw more money over there than I will ever see again in my life. We were handling billions of dollars. Okay, next slide. This is where uh, meeting with the bank uh, leaders and talking about how we're going to do that exchange. Um, we were responsible for it in all three of the uh, provinces that we were in. Next slide, please. Okay, this shows you the banks, and that, I'll just go through these real quickly, but. Uh, this was the Saladin province, and so those were the banks that we were going to. Uh, every time we went out, any of my guys, of course, were carrying lots of money, and if any bad guys knew that, that makes us pretty high target. So we had to be pretty careful. 
And I'll tell you, those Humvees traveled as fast as they would go because I didn't want my guys getting shot at. So every place we went, they floored it. And we went as fast as those Humvees would go. Okay, next slide. <coughs> this is uh, the banks up in uh, Atamin province. And I mentioned the Asalo Maya. We didn't, we didn't work or do the banks up in that area. Again, those guys were very, very pro-Western. This is the border of Iran. I, I got the chance to come up this far, not very far from Iran. Like I said, that's where I had my McDowell's hamburger. Um, Kirkuk was also very pro-Western. And right now the Kurds in Turkey, in Syria, and in Iraq are still really trying to fight to become their own country. And so that's part of the turmoil that's over there is you've got people who don't want to be part of the rest of their country trying to become their own part. And, and really the Kurds are over in Iran too. So you got four countries that the Kurds are in, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and uh, Iran, that they would really rather be their own country. And uh, they're very pro-Western, they love America, so we never really had any problems except when somebody from other places would come up and cause us problems up here. Matter of fact, during the initial bombing and war against Iraq, these guys took all their tanks and equipment and stuff and parked them in a way that we had sent them notice. If you put them in a parking lot, basically, and point them so that they're all pointing to the inside and just place them like that. We won't even bomb them. They'll save us bombs and save your equipment. And so they did that up here, and we didn't even have to bomb up there. This was one of the first places that uh, our airborne troops went into and secured the airfield that's up there. Matter of fact, those pictures from when we were loading the gold bars, that was up here at the air base in, in Kirkuk. Okay, next slide. And then these are the pictures down here in Baghdad, uh, the Diyala province by Bukuba. Bukuba and Beijing. Those were probably the two worst towns that we had as, uh, if you went there, either one of those places, you really better be watching what's going on because there were a whole lot of people who would rather see us dead in those two countries, or those two towns. So I had one of my detachments was here in Tikrit with me, one of them up in Kirkuk, one of them down in Balad, and then one of them over in Bakuba. And they weren't really in Bakuba, there's an air base outside of that, but um, we had to be real careful on any missions that they went on just because it was so dangerous down there. Okay, next slide. This is the uh, money that we transferred in, we put out, and uh, I'll have up here on the table, I don't want to pass it around, but I've got one of these that it is in Arabic also, and it shows the features of the new money that we were transferring in there. Like I said, that was one of the big deals that we did <coughs> as when we were over there was uh, take the old currency out, and so we exchanged dinar, is what these were, uh, dinar note. Uh, we exchanged a dinar for a dinar. So whatever they brought in, if it was a 250 dinar note, they got a 250 new dinar note for it. And so then we had to do something with all those old uh, dinar notes. We either shredded them, burnt them, or dyed them with a red dye. And once they were dyed with a red dye, they couldn't be exchanged anymore. We didn't want people hitting our trucks, taking the dinars from us, and then taking them back and getting them exchanged again. We also, and I've got in this envelope, and I'm not gonna pass it around either, several different times that we realized there are a whole lot of money floating around out there, not on very good paper. That's because they were counterfeiting it. They'd taken the plates from their, their treasury and had gone out and were running these off. We found one of them in a uh, uh, poultry uh, chicken ranch farm, and uh, another one just like a, a hay mill, hay mill. So they were out there producing new banknotes and cutting them up on just crap pieces of paper, and that's what these are, is uh, these are actual counterfeits that they had made that I was able, matter of fact, this one here, 
It's not even a, it doesn't have synopsis space or anything on there. They didn't get finished printing it. <laughs> but we confiscated those from them and got the plates. I wanted to keep one of the plates too, but uh, uh, U.S. Treasury Department was there and they didn't, uh, the Secret Service, they didn't uh, let me keep them. <laughs> Next slide, please. This is, uh, again, that's Vince Garcia. My, he was my operations officer, me. And then these two guys here are British. Uh, they were contractors, and, and a lot of the work that we did, we worked with contractors. Uh, those two guys are British. Uh, real good friendship with him and his family now. I've uh, seen him about three times since uh, coming back from Iraq. Uh, real good friend of mine. Next slide, please. Saul Shonaher, that's his name. Okay, we also did, uh, like I said, Ministry of Commerce, Agriculture, and Irrigation. Like I said, you don't, you don't, when you're in the military, you don't volunteer for anything. Well, I accidentally did, so. Next slide, please. So we went out right there into Crete, right outside of town. It was the dairy company, went out and met with them. Um, if you've ever had raw yogurt, it's pretty nasty, but you don't turn down something when they uh, offer it to you. So I had to eat. But at least I didn't have to. One of their delicacies over there is to um, bring out a goat's head and eat the eyes. Oh, oh God. I never had to do that. So oh. I had to eat raw yogurt. I didn't have to eat the inside. I was glad of that. <laughs> they made uh, yogurt, all different kinds of yogurt, you know, products, cheese, that kind of stuff. One of the things that we had to do for them, though, was they would haul their milk. Well, they had to do it early in the morning because once it start, once that sun comes up, it would get 120, 130 degrees outside just like that. Really hot in the summer. So these guys would have to get that milk hauled early in the morning. Well, one of the things that I did for them was we wrote up a letter to give to their truckers, and I signed it, and it was both English and Arabic that allowed them, a, it was a sheet of paper that if they got stopped by any of our patrols, they could give them that sheet and say, look, we're authorized to be out here on the road hauling this milk because we've got to do it at night. And so that was one of the things I was able to help them uh, with so that they didn't have their uh, trucks getting stopped for a long time or a horse getting shot up. And next. This was one of the grain elevators that I went to. Huge grain elevators. Um, this was a tent outside of it, a World Food Program. We, as a, a, one of many nations, shipped a lot of food to their country to uh, give them enough food to eat. You done with that? Not yet. Uh, so that's what that was. They preferred U.S. wheat <coughs> over anything else. Australian wheat was a, uh, a, a distant second, I should say. That's, all. that's there. That's the wheat. And just uh, behind bags. Okay, next. That's my uh, XO. That one of the my executive officer, I guess I should say, Matt Voigthofer, worked with me the whole time we were over there. Next. This was uh, at the sliding, and the, they, we called him the governor. I don't know what his uh, Arabic title was, but we had gone there with uh, one of our ambassadors to meet with him and, and so I had escorted her there and was there at that meeting with them to try to figure out what it is that we could do for them to help them because when we first went over there everything shut down like I said everything was run by the government that's one of the things of a socialist country everything's run by the government well once the government disappeared everything shut down I mean everything they didn't have they weren't getting their pay, there was no food distribution, there was no gas distribution, there was no power, there was no water. I mean, all those things that we take, we come in a room and flip on a switch. It took me about five months of being home to be able to get used to walking into a room and turning on a switch and there actually it'd be a light on. Or going into to take a shower and turning on the water 
and there actually be water. So it, uh, they lived a very basic life because things just shut down because the government was controlling everything. So like I said, we were there trying to help get things going again to help them work, uh, get everything working. Go ahead, next slide. Okay, I don't know if you recognize these guys. This is Saddam Hussein right there in the center. And those are two, his two sons, Uday and Kusay. They were all three on the run still when we got over there. Um, Uday and Kusay were especially bad. They, were, they had a very bad reputation of torturing and killing people for no reason and enjoying them. They captured them up north out of, of our area in Mosul, up close to uh, Turkey. Uh, Mosul was in a whole another area operated by a whole different unit from ours. They, they got both of them in the same house on the same day, uh, and I said they got them. Uh, they didn't take them alive. They, they, were both, they both were killed by the time it was over. Saddam, though, was still on the loose, and we knew he was in our area because that's where he was originally from and because we kept getting tips. And while we were getting those tips, we were also picking up money, and we were picking up valuables. And one of the things that was uh, turned into us one time was they had captured one, one of his wives, and with her was a bunch of jewelry that we were sure had come from Kuwait, which you guys learned about that we'd been in Iraq two different times, back in 1990, and then again in 2003. Well, when they, the reason we went over in 1990 was because Saddam had gone into Kuwait and occupied Kuwait. It was a separate country. He wanted to annex it and make it part of uh, Iraq. They kicked him out, but they took all kinds of stuff with them when they left. Well, some of those things were some jewels that we captured with one of his wives. So that got turned into my unit. We took it and turned it back into our headquarters, which was down in Kuwait, and then they got it back to the Kuwait government. Anyway, Saddam was running around in our area. Like I said, we knew because we kept getting tips. Next week. Well, on the 13th of December, the brigade right in our area, in Tikrit, captured him, right over across the river from us, about six miles away. And that was his actual hometown, Abdullah. We were in Tikrit, and they captured him. I never saw uh, Saddam, because as soon as they captured him, they verified who he was, put a hood on his head, put him onto a, a helicopter, and took him to an undisclosed location, which I don't know where that is. I don't know where it was. But this is the little place where they captured him. This was the hole that he had climbed down in. It was a little tiny room about the size of from where my wife Tina there is over and then about in here. About that big. Just a little room for him to hide in. He didn't live down in there. He just uh, went down in there any time that he felt like it was threat. And there was a this was a big styrofoam block that just fit down over the top of it to make it look like it was a rock and dirt with everything else that was there, but they found him when they uh, were there. Well, when they found him, he had a uh, taxi sitting out on the road just right close to where uh, his, the house, the farm houses were that he was staying in. And in that taxi, the trunk of that taxi, was this box here. And um, the night that they captured Saddam, General Odierno, who was my boss, he called me up to his office. It was Saturday night at 10 o'clock. So Saturday night at 10 o'clock at night, and I'm thinking, why does the general need to see me now? And the worst possible things are going through my mind. I'm thinking one of my soldiers got killed, or I did something and I wasn't aware of it, and I was in big trouble. Because I, I would go see the general, but... 
that was the only time ever I went on a Saturday night at 10 o'clock at night because the general wanted to see me. So I went up there with just a little bit of anticipation on what was going on. When I walked in, it was they were in his conference room and a whole bunch of people standing around and they were smoking cigars. And I'm wondering, what the heck is going on? This box was sitting in the middle of the conference table. And I walked in and he says, Scott, I want you to take control of that box for me and you keep it until I tell you to do something else with it. Yes, sir. Well, I looked in the box and it's full of $100 bills, bundles. There was $750,000 in there. $750,000, that's not a small amount of money. But it wasn't the largest that we'd captured. We'd already captured boxes that were about this big by this big by about this big at $4 million each in And we'd got three of those. So I'm wondering why, when I've already handled $12 million, did he call me up for $750,000 on a Saturday night at 10 o'clock? And I got to stand in there, and he was uh, one of the guys, actually the uh, brigade commander, standing there holding the, the book. And on the front of it, it said possible Saddam locations. Well, that gave me a hint of what's going on. And I asked him, is that why we're here? Is this because you guys captured him? He said, yep. So the next day then, go ahead and next slide. The next day we had a press conference, General Odierno. Uh, actually, what happened first is down in Baghdad, which was about uh, 150 miles away from us, they announced, oh, I'm, I gotta wrap it up here, don't I? They announced that they had captured Saddam at the uh, U.S. Embassy in the Green Zone. Uh, Admiral, or, um, Mr. Bremer, who was over there as our United States representative, he made the official announcement. Then we held a press conference. You see that box right there, that's the box that they gave me and that's that $750,000 that's in there. Like I said, that's my boss, General Odierno, making the announcement and doing the prep briefing on what all happened. Go to the next slide. There's, uh, that's the box, that's my hand holding there. I wasn't gonna let go of that baby. Make sure nobody took off with it. And if you could go back up a couple slides. That's my driver there, so that's me and my driver. We were at that press conference, we took it up for the press conference, and there we were taking it back out after the press conference. Okay, go down, and one more. That's me and uh, uh, Christopher Jones, Major Matt Boyd Hopper, and he was my S2, my S3, and my, S, uh, my XO, which non-military, I know you don't know what that means. Um, they were my officers that helped me get the stuff that we did on a daily basis done. But that's that's the money. Those are all hundred dollar bills. And those were the only hundred dollar bills that we saw the whole time we were over there. Is what we captured from them because everything we did was in twenty dollar bills or lower or Iraqi money. Can you slide? And there's that's outside. This is the. Uh, uh, building that we brought in from Turkey that we uh, used as our headquarters to see behind it. Sandbags there, that's because like I said they were lob RPMs, or RPGs, or, uh, or mortars in at us so we had to try to protect ourselves a little bit. So, and then that's the box there. I actually ended up keeping that box in my office. We turned the money in but I kept the box. Uh, kept that in my office. I carried that home with me on the plane. When I got back to uh, the United States then, I took it over and I gave it to the 4th Infantry Division's Museum, and it's on display down there now with some of these same pictures up uh, showing what, it, what the history behind it is. Okay, next slide. We also, this, this is one of those boxes that had $4 million in it, and that's what they, uh, I don't know what he's got uh, Saddam's picture on there. The ones we, we captured didn't have Saddam's picture on there. But they were bundled like this and just just shoved in there every bit of space that they could take, $4 million. A uh, week after we captured Saddam, found two more of them buried over across the river, just right within almost throwing distance where we were. Um, 
So we captured a total of tw five boxes, $20 million, and over 1,000 gold bars while I was there. Okay, next. That's a picture when we got back to um, Fort Hood, Texas. That's me and my family and my wife there, our three daughters. Uh, that was my <coughs> battalion sign out in front of our, our battalion headquarters building. My uh, sergeant major there, a lot in Okay, and next slide. This is the uh, statue that I was talking about. We lost 93 people out of the division. Their names are on each one of those little plaques there. This is the uh, statue that we made out of those horse statues that were on the front of the gate. And a little girl, this represents a little Iraqi girl comforting the soldier after loss of one of his friends. That was at uh, Fort Hood, Texas. Uh, the division itself moved to uh, Fort um, Carson, Colorado now. So I, I believe that that probably has gotten moved out there too. Okay, I have some stuff up here that you guys are welcome to come up and I'll, I'll kind of talk through what's here. Um, that you're welcome to come up and take a look at it. Uh, you've had a question, I guess I'll go ahead. Um, how did you get into that one water They, it, wherever we were was above water. And so you walked in that ground level and then all of the building was up Mrs. over the top Popper? of it. Mrs. Popper? Yes? I apologize for interrupting, but you said Abby came in to the office yeah. with you. Yes. Well, yes. Well, did you ever get robbed with your transporting uh, the money? We had, actually the largest military engagement was on one of our convoys. Like I said, we worked with those uh, two guys who were in civilian clothes. We worked with them. They had contracted guards. They were actually Fijian uh, people from the island of Fiji. Uh, and so they were running around with their own weapons and they were in civilian. But then each of the units that were in the areas where those money was moving had guards that would escort those convoys too, yes. No. <laughs> yes, there was um, some of the other officers went to a meeting where they had some. Yeah. You know, it depends on what the goals were, but we figured about a quarter of a million dollars. <laughs> Do I speak Arabic? I know Salam Alaikum and I know um, Inshallah. Salam Alaikum, like I said, that means uh, peace yeah. be with you. Inshallah, that's what we kept getting told every time something didn't quite go the way we, because it was like um, in God willing, but, um, if God wants it that way. Like, no, do it. Because um, they would give us that as kind of an excuse that, uh, well, it didn't happen because that wasn't supposed to be. Those are the main two that I know. Um, did you, was there Jeremy Anderson? Was there what? Jeremy Anderson. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I I didn't know anybody from this area when when we were over there. Sorry. How much did it weigh We We didn't weigh them, but I figure they were about 30 to 40 pounds. And they were, they were pretty heavy. Right. Like I said, you got uh, I got stuff up here you can come look at my uh, okay. Hold on. Look, 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 everybody sit. Okay, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I just we we have a method to our 